All right. Welcome to week six. Um, as I mentioned last week, we've, we're done covering new material before the break. So today, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go over what's going to be on the midterm, the rules of engagement, that kind of stuff. I am not doing a detailed review. I hate detailed reviews. Why? I'm trying to jam five weeks of content in 45 minutes. That's just stupid. It's a waste of your time because all it's going to do is confuse you. So what I'm going to do is give you the exam format and that kind of thing. Uh, and then I'm going to do, I'm going to go over the whole normalization thing one more time because as a review for the concepts and the topics, which has been one of the bigger issues uh, this term. Um, so here are my notes for the midterm for you guys. So it's next Tuesday at, whoop, not three o'clock, five o'clock. I forgot. Five. Yep. Sorry, five o'clock, not three o'clock. My bad. Up till now, all my courses have been at three o'clock for like the last two years. So my brain still thinks it's three. It's 45 questions. Four, four, five questions, not four or five, 45 questions. It's multiple guests or true, false. Yes. I'm getting there. Holy impatient. Well, it's multiple choice, but I'm sure some people will be guessing. You, you, you'll have the people that sit there with their pencil that they wrote a different number on each side. Um. I only thought that happened in anime until I actually saw it happening in class once. The person literally rolled their pencil for, for, for good luck. Um, and you have one hour to do 45 questions. That is generous. The, I had to block the camera. So 45, so the university standard for a multiple choice question is 45 seconds a question. That is the university standard. The college standard is one minute per question. Now, so you guys are going, holy cow, that's not a lot of time per question. Some of the questions you'll be able to answer in significantly less than one minute, which will give you more time for questions you have problems with. So realistically, one minute per question would be more than adequate, which is 45 minutes. However, we're giving you guys an extra 15 minutes on top of that. Okay. Now, I forgot to put this in here. However, if you have Cal accommodations, book your time at Cal. I have not received a single test confirmation yet, even though you guys know the midterm has been coming. I've told you guys this week, last week, that it was coming. Technically, there will be enough time for you to do it in class if you want to do it in class. But if you have other accommodations, like you're allowed to listen to music while you write a test. And yes, that is an accommodation that they do for some people. Or you need a non-distracting environment. This is not non-distracting. Okay. Okay. So if you have special accommodations and you need to use them, book Cal. Because i got to give them a copy of the test for you. It's been printed. It's waiting for me to pick it up. I just missed it today. Now, to answer the lady's question, yes, it's on paper. It is a Scantron test. Now, usually, a lot of the pros that do computer essentials go over how to take a Scantron test properly. How many of you have done a Scantron test at least once in your lives? Congratulations. Now, I am going to go over how to fill in the bubbles properly. Because you know what? I've had a student once get a three on their test out of 100 questions because they didn't know how to fill in bubbles. So here's a little, a few tips about Scantron that you may not know. One, two, three, four, five, right? You got usually five bubbles for your questions. And when you fill it in, You fill in the whole thing. If you do this, it's not going to care. If you do this, it thinks you're a tool. If you do this, it doesn't even know you tried. 
Okay? This is the only one that will work. Now, here's pro tip number two. Bring the best freaking eraser you can find. Why? Because Scantron, and a lot of people don't realize this, Scantron reads left to right. So let's just say, oh, this was not the right answer, so you kind of do that. And then you fill in this bubble here. Depending on what kind of mood the Scantron machine is in, it'll pick that up as your answer. That's another place where people lose points. They might have had the right answer here, but because Scantron does this, it may not pick up the answer correctly. Okay. So, that having been said, it's important that you guys learn how to fill in the bubbles. Because you're going to be doing an awful lot of Scantron tests at the school. Uh, it's a popular way of reducing our grading load. Now, other thing, on the Scantron sheet, there's a spot for your name and a spot for your student number. Write your name and fill in the bubbles. I've had people write their names on it and not fill in the bubbles. And the best part is, is they left without me actually double checking the paper. They just threw it in the box and left. And I didn't even notice. So when the Scantron test came through, it came in as an anonymous student. And the second point of that one, at least if there's a student number, I can probably try to find you because at least I'll have that on the results. I don't get the Scantron sheets back for up to three weeks after I drop them off for scanning. I'll drop them off for scanning. I have the results usually next day, two business days at most. So, you know, you do the test on Tuesday, probably by Thursday, I'll have your grades for your midterm and they'll be posted by Friday. If I don't have the Scantron sheet with your name on it, how am I supposed to know what your grade is? So I'll give you three guesses what grade you get. That's it. Because if I can't grade it, I'm not going to give you grades. You could have the best grades coming into the midterm and you've screwed up your Scantron sheet, you're SOL. S, out of luck. Fill in the S. I have a minor in the room, so I actually have to avoid certain words. So, yeah, the Scantron, this is your first kick at the can of Scantron, probably one of the first ones, unless uh, you have a test on Monday. Um, so, yeah, so you bring in an HB pencil. Don't bring a nice hard pencil. Don't come up to me and say, can I use a pen? Because last time I had spare pencils and somebody took every single one of them. So I don't have any more spare pencils. Um, and I didn't find any in my department's supply cabinets, so I guess they stopped giving us spare pencils. Okay, so that's that. The So that's it for Scantron. So just make sure when you do the Scantron sheet, you put in your name, fill in the bubbles, put in your student number, fill in the bubbles. That's the two absolute must-required parts other than your answers. If you don't want to put anything on the answers, that's cool. That's, you know, up to you. That's when you start rolling the dice to hope for the best. That will also mean that you will not have your computers on the desk because it's a closed book. No computer, no phones. Unless there's like a major life emergency and you must have your phone present. And there has been cases, valid cases of that. My wife went into labor. I'm not kidding. I had someone say that. I'm like, what are you doing here? Oh, like, what are you doing here? So I don't want to fail my midterm. Dude, I would have exempted you. But he showed up. Phone didn't go off. He left. Good job. But, you know, there's reasons to have the phone on the desk, but they have to be really good reasons. Otherwise, phone goes in there. So if you have a locker... Better off to leave most of your stuff in your locker. If not, it's going to be in your bags. I'm going to let you guys keep your bags with you under your desks. That way, at least, we won't have this big mountain pile of bags at the front where I now feel responsible for people's stuff. And I don't know who, whose bag belongs to who, so if somebody takes your stuff, that's not my problem. But just warning you. All right. So, what are the things you got to study? 
lectures one to five. The slide decks specifically as they are on Brightspace. Because those, not necessarily the ones where I modified a little bit for the lecture where I took out some examples and stuff. <clears throat> the slides on Brightspace are the ones going to, that the test is based on. The recommended reading. Yeah, if you've done it, great. If you haven't, you probably won't suffer. You'll still be able to get through the test. Hybrid, and I didn't even spell that right. Herbid. Hybrid 1. I did a quick double check really quick earlier today, and I didn't see any questions from Hybrid 2 because it's not due till after the midterm. So that doesn't really make sense to test you guys on stuff you haven't done. So Hybrid 1, the topics from Hybrid 1 may or may not be on the test, so you'll just want to review the content really quick. Specifically, what is it going to be on there? Um, shockingly enough, the five topics I've got listed right there line up almost identical to the slide decks. So you're going to cover, it's going to cover, ask you questions about entities and attributes. So what are entities? What are attributes? Uh, strong and weak entities. And, uh, you know, what's the difference? Um, it's going to talk, uh, there's going to be questions about the different kinds of relationships, you know, one-to-one, one, one-to-many, many-to-many. Um, we're also going to cover, I'm actually going to keep a copy of this and actually post this. Um, we're also going to, it's also going to talk about, um, there might be some questions about data types. So you know how we talked a little bit about the different data types last, like two weeks ago. So yeah, the Varkar and the Int and all that. Uh, there might be a few questions about, hey, uh, the person's trying to put in a postal code, what kind of data type and pick the best of the four choices kind of thing. Um, no, no, the questions are more a little more generic than that. Because like with everything else, depending what your data source is, your your length might be different. Yeah, so it's gonna be more like, oh, we're gonna put in a person's address. So you're gonna use a car field, a var car field, a text field, that kind of question, not sizes. There's none of that. Because that's subjective. Okay. Um and of course, there's going to be questions about normalization, uh, everybody's favorite topic. Um, basically, questions about first, second, third normal form. Um, usually, the questions from what I am recalling off the top of my head, because um, I looked at the, the midterm like last week. So it's mostly the definitions of like to be in first normal form, you must have this. To be in second normal form, you must have this. Um, and good old BCNF might be a question in there too. Uh, there's going to be, a, there may be some questions about data anomalies, uh, insert anomaly, update anomaly, et cetera, et cetera. And as I go through the example today of the normalization, I'll be rediscussing those specific topics. So it'll be a refresher from last week's uh, lecture. Okay. Um, do we have any specific questions about the midterm or did I give you guys enough detail? Yes. No, that's, they're literally multiple choice. So you'll have first to be in first normal form, it must be, and then you have pick of four choices. Now, some of the questions are worded a little tricky. So make sure you pay attention to reading it. I have, gone over these questions in the past and tried to make sure that they were um, understandable, especially for people where English is not their first language. And for those of us that English is not our first language, let's all raise our hands. There we go. Right? Just because I don't have an accent doesn't mean English is my first language. So, yeah, some French. So, yeah, there's a reason why we give you guys an extra 15 minutes. Actually, that's the best show of hands I've ever had for not the first language. I have to say, I think that was like close to 95% of the class. Um, pretty spectacular, I have to say. Um, all right, so any other questions about the midterm? Otherwise, I'm going to dive in the whole normalization thing one more time without the slides. Okay, going once. Well, 
Yes, they are. <laughs> they are. Because the slides summarize the textbook. It, it says pretty much the same thing with fewer words. Sometimes you take a paragraph, you bring it down to five words, it's definitely going to be not quite the same. Some of the slides have pictures that are not from the textbook, which is why I'm saying, based on the slides, the textbook will help expand the concepts. Yeah, I know. Yeah, which is exactly why I say slides first, textbook second. So the slides have a lot less words than the textbook to study. But it's slides first, then textbook. Um, when we were developing this midterm a while back, because this is just a rehash and with some fresh questions mixed in and rotated around, um, we, I made a point that if the, you guys did not have it in writing, you were, it was not allowed to be on the test. So if it's not in the slides and it's not in the textbook, it's never going to be on the test. It won't be based on anything I said at the front of the class. Because that's what I say versus another prof says may not be the same thing. Okay. Have a, have a, study the slides, skim the textbook. Okay. Now I'm going to make this nice and big. Oops. No, don't do that. Jim does, not Jim Doe. I'm trying to make a point for to not have the uh, issue I had last time where you couldn't read it from the back. I, I'm bringing up one screen because I'm going to be writing on that board. Unfortunately, my camera is not going to pick up what's on that board, but I will be taking pictures to go with it. <clears throat> okay, so normalization. Currently, this is not what's considered a proper uh, relation. Um, because there's a few different issues. We have two problems for it to not be in um, first normal form. And now I need to get it to fit on the screen. Almost there. There. Guy, people at the back, you can still read that? Okay. So, it's funny, you know, you put it that much further away and it doesn't fit anymore. Because, you know, the screen is that much further away and it's enough to make it too wide. Okay, so, reason why this is not in um, first normal form. One, we have repeating groups of rows. This, right over here. Because you'll see that this block, uh, heck, I'll go and circle it on the other side for the other people too. I don't want you guys to feel excluded. Oh, this is not going to work. Never mind. They not, didn't give me enough whiteboard. Okay, might as well put that back down. Let's see if I can wear out that motor today. Um, just try to see what I'm doing over here. Sorry, guys. Uh, I could just draw on the white on the screen. I'm kidding. Um, over here, block right here is what I've got circled on the other side. This chunk here is a group of repeating groups of rows. And because this whole block right here belongs together, but there's not any data carried down. So to be in first normal form, technically, there must be no repeating groups of rows. And that also means that's also called a um, I had a discussion in my other class about this. It's not a multi-valued attribute. It's the 
um, multi-valued columns or multi-valued rows. So you can't have this. So how do you fix that? That one's pretty easy to fix. You just populate it. Yeah, control C, control V in this case. Because my handwriting is so bad that I prefer to do this couple, first couple of steps on there. So I, that's item number one. Item number two, now that we fix this issue, is we have not identified our primary key. And to identify the primary key, we have to look at what's in this set of data and try to figure out what actually can be used to uniquely identify a given row. When we look at the data that we have, we can see that we have an employee number, we've got a name, we've got an email, an hourly rate, a project number, a description, and some hours. Now, what seems to be the most unique is the combination of employee number and project number. So if I search through these rows of data and I find that that combination is unique for every row, fantastic. So in theory, we can say, at least with the data we've been given, and yes, I'm fully aware that this is not a good example, but it's close enough to a good example, that those two are gonna be our primary key. So we have employee number and project number. So we can now state with a fair amount of confidence that we are now in first normal form. First normal form means the primary keys are defined or identified, not necessarily defined, they're identified, and there's no repeating groups of columns. That's first normal form. Yay, we're there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to transcribe that to this board. Not the whole thing, just the row of fields. And then I'm going to start identifying the different dependencies. And in this case, I actually avoided one kind of dependency, and I'm going to be adding it in later so I can discuss it separately. So if I go... Uh, Let's say I call this entity timesheet, and I have employee ID, name, email, hourly rate, project number, Project description and hours. All right. And I'm going to mark my primary key so that everybody is aware. Just like this. All right. So now we have to start identifying our dependencies. And when we look at the data, we are good. we're going to look at what depends on each of the keys. So we know this is in first NF. Actually, I should write that down. So when we look at our dependencies, we need to worry about, um, the first things first, we're gonna try to find our things that are fully dependent. So by fully dependent means that the value is identifiable by the entire key. So when we look at this, we can say, well, the employee name is only identified by the employee ID. It's not defined by the project number. Email, same thing. Hourly rate, same thing. Right, so when we look at how the data is laid out, the, the hourly rate is set to match an employee and not a given project, okay? So we know none of this is fully dependent. The project description, well, that depends on the project number. You know, it has nothing to do with the employee. However, the number of hours worked. For the hours, yeah, but if you look at the data, each employee worked on two different projects. I made a point to make sure I didn't make that mistake this time. So hours currently is fully dependent on the entire key. So. OK, 
Okay. So we know that the hours is fully dependent on the employee ID and the project number. Fantastic. So which then leaves everything else that hasn't been identified as a different kind of dependency. And to, for things to be in second normal form, it has to be first in first normal form, and there can be no partial dependencies. A partial dependency is when a value depends only part of the key. So we know that the name, the email, and the hourly rate is only dependent on that. And the project description only depends on the project number. So now we've identified two kinds of dependencies. And for those of you that are astute, will notice I don't have the third kind of dependency in here. I made a point as for my first example to not have that third kind right away. I want people to understand these two first before I muddy the waters and make things a little more complicated. So, how do we fix things to be in second normal form? You take out the partial dependencies into their own entities. So, we will have something that looks like this. Actually, let's go let's take care of your employees first. And in this table, That's our primary key. At this point in time, everything in here is now dependent on the employee ID. We're gonna have something called project. Project description. Again, the entire thing is dependent on the entire key. So then all we have left is the pieces that we took out of here. So if we look at the timesheet, we have the employee ID, project number, and the hours. Now, an actual, an actual fact, and just give me a moment. I'll answer that statement. Yeah, it's gonna, this one's gonna get two lines. Now, technically, this one went from first normal form straight to third normal form because I didn't have that third kind of, an, of uh, dependency, which is the transitive. So we went from first, and by making it second normal form, it just so happened that everything became third normal form. And technically, it's boys cod and fourth, because there, none of those other kinds of dependencies are in there. So it is fully normalized. It just happened. Now, employee, in this case, is a strong entity. I might as well do a bit of review about this stuff at the same time, right? It's a strong entity because it doesn't depend on anything else for its existence. Project is also a strong entity because again, it can live on its own. The timesheet is a weak entity. Exactly. So what's happened here is that its primary key is also made up of foreign keys. So that means that there's not a single row of information in the timesheet that can exist without a matching record in the strong entities. So this is a weak entity. 
this, I'm covering like six different topics in this example. Like this is like the best review ever because I'm, it's a practical review. This is a composite, not compound, composite key, which also just so happens to make this not only is a weak entity, it's also an an associative associative entity because it associates both of these. It's an intersect if there's not an extra column because there's an extra column in here at the hours, it's an associative entity, not an intersect. It's just, they, they're the same thing. They serve the same purpose, it's just one has more information in it. So, and okay, a, an intersect table is when you have, so if you have table A, table B, and in table C, we have the primary key from A, primary key from B. This is an intersect, an intersection table. The second I add anything else, this doesn't come from outside of it. Therefore, this is now an associative entity. Literally, the only difference between an intersect or an intersection entity and an associative entity is the presence of one extra, one or more extra pieces of data that's unique to itself. What do you mean? Yes. That's a specific, yeah, so this, it associates both of those. No, no, it's a an associative entity. That that's it. Yeah, it's an associative entity that is a weak entity. Yeah, it's an identifying it's an identifying relationship. That's what you were trying to say. All right, so it's an identifying relationship because it's weak. It's possible to have a weak entity. It's actually it's possible to have a weak entity without identifying relation with without the identifying relationships. The second that the primary keys of the parent tables are involved in the primary key of the child, it's now a weak entity. It also means that it is a an identifying relationship. Okay. So this covers a fairly simple set of concepts. I'm going to take a picture of the board before I start erasing things. And a little bit further, my back. Okay. Okay, so this is fine as a starting example. Now, the issue we have is we did talk about transitives. And I am currently trying to come up with a way to shove a transitive in this. <laughs> um, because I really thought this through up to this point so that I could cover like half the term of material as a simple example. Um, hang on, I'm thinking really hard. Okay, I've got it, I've got it. So I'm gonna modify my table and I'm gonna save this, hang on. Save as two. Okay. So by adding just a single column in here, I've now created a transitive so that I can continue past this example and I'll be able to fix this up in a moment. Okay, that's why I took a picture before I started erasing. Now, what's happened here is I threw in something called a rate ID because often when you work for a contracting company, 
not everybody has their own unique rate. Everybody is assigned a certain rate. For example, at my day job, when we do custom development for a client, we charge $1,500 a day US. That's our rate. Whether we have one person working on the project or four, we try to make it one person as much as possible. Better profit margin, right? So we have specific rates, like we have a preferred rate, which might be $1,200 US per day. We have one other client where we do an hourly rate. So they're like rate class three, where we charge them, I don't remember what it is, like $110 an hour US, something like that. So when we charge, when they enter it in the accounting system, they pick a rate that the hours are being charged at. So I threw in the rate in here just so that we'd have a transitive. So suddenly what we have is our primary keys have not changed. They have not changed at all. So I am just going to erase part of this and go through this process one more time. Just clean up, clean up, get rid of this, get rid of that. And I'm gonna leave that one alone for now. And now I need to somehow fit something in the middle here. Hang on. Employee ID. Uh, name, email, rate, ID, and that's going to be the hourly rate, just so I can fit it in here, like that. All right, fantastic. So, we're going to go back to the beginning, and our primary keys have not changed. So far, so good. So we can still say that the hours depend on the project number and the employee ID. Okay. Now the, you'll notice when you look at the data that the rate ID and the hourly rates repeated and it stays the same for each employee because we actually contract out the employees at a specific rate. It's not, well, I could have moved the rate and moved it to the project also. That could have been a choice for this, but for now, we're assuming that the rate is tied to an employee. Employee Jane Doe is 110 bucks an hour. Uh, Jim Does is 126 bucks an hour. Uh, why Jim's been there for 10 years longer? So he's only worth $20, $26 an hour more for 10 years of experience. Um, well, you know, that's still uh, $52,000 a year more. Check the number, double it, and add three zeros. And so your hourly rate, so you take that hourly rate, double it, and add three zeros, and it tells you how much you make a year. If ever you were curious on calculating how much you make a year really fast. Now, so we the key has not changed. Great. We still have the same partial dependencies. However, we've added one to the mix. So I am going to put in a curly bracket on this one because we're going to treat this as one thing for now. All right, so the rate and the hourly depends on the employee, as does the name and the email. So now we still have our partial dependencies. Great. However, now we're going to fix our little bit of normalization so that we have these two things thrown in here. We have the rate ID. and the hourly rate, okay? Um, hours is down here. We haven't lost it. Now, by just adding that one column, we've managed to add our, our happy, unpleasant um, last issue. So this one, Actually, I'm going to write this in red. Where's my red? Over here. So this one's in 3NF. Because previously it was in 3NF, so we're going to leave it in 3NF. There's nothing changed. These two are 3NF. Great. This one right now is in second normal form. Why? Because it has a transitive dependency. 
So for those of you that, just as a quick reminder, if A defines B, B defines C, that means A also defines C, which in this case, the hourly rate is not defined by the employee at all. It's defined by the rate ID. So that means that this one depends on an attribute as an identifier that is not part of the key. When an attribute depends on an identifier that is not part of the primary key, it is known as a transitive dependency. A transitive dependency, to get things into third normal form, what do you do? You break it into something else. So, yeah, yeah, it's dependent, so you need to break it out to its own thing. Yeah, exactly. Employee ID is a determinant. The rate ID is a determinant, but the rate ID is not a determinant of the employee. It's all... Exactly. Exactly. That's what you're having such a hard time with. That's why I picked on you. We've had this conversation before. <laughs> yes, but that's the pro. That's why it's part of this process. Yeah, in theory, we could have gone straight from this to third normal form by skipping second normal form. However, it doesn't highlight the concept of the transitive dependency. Thus, I'm going to do it the right way and not skip steps. You know when you take a math test and you just write the answer and they give you a zero because you didn't show the steps? The same thing. It's the transitive dependency. is a, an attribute that depends on, 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 on it's an attribute that depends on, on, on an identifier that is not part of the key. Well, no, but it's possible to have a determinant that depends on another determinant. In this case, this determinant depends on this key. This depends on this. This one depends on that. The second you say this depends on this, and then depends on that, it's a transitive because you are transiting through dependent, I mean, a, a determinant, to find the dependent. A to B, B to C, A does C. On the identifier. Yes. That's it. You got it. Oh, you want me? Okay, we can do that. That's easy. A, B, C. A determines B. B determines C. Therefore, A determines C. So, how do you fix this? You would break it into its own Yeah, you identify all the, the ID. You select your identifiers and no repeating groups of row uh, columns. That is first normal form. Okay, so now how do you fix this one? Is you, again, employee. We have employee ID. Name, email, rate ID. We can have, let's call this rates. We have rate ID and the rate. And I'm going to copy the last two. Project, which has project number. And description.
and the timesheet, which is project. Why can I not write today? Project number. Actually, I'm going to do it the right way. We had employee ID project number and hours. Okay, now to grab my other markers to make things nice and colorful. Okay. Now, RAID is a strong entity. Employee is also a strong entity. Even though it does have a foreign key, the foreign key doesn't identify anything. So it's able to live. An employee can exist without a RAID. For example, we don't associate an hourly rate to our receptionist at work. She still works there, but we don't contract out her time. Therefore, she doesn't even get a RAID ID. Project is strong because it can live on its own. Timesheet is still weak because it has the compound, uh, the composite key that is also foreign keys. Would be null. That's exactly how I do it. So now I am going to take two more pictures and I'm going to erase this board because I'm going to do work based on that going forward. Yes. Yes. Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. There could theoretically be one last entry in this. Like, it's not on there. But I could potentially have... Or how about... Uh, um, I don't know what letter that was supposed to be, but... I could have this situation. Right? So, in theory, we could do multiple entries for that employee, like they did the work twice, so they get the bill it twice. The billing date is part of the primary key, but because part of the primary key is still foreign keys, it's still a weak entity. So, this is totally valid. Actual fact, I'll leave it even leave it in there for my next set of examples. Okay. Yes. It is not a weak entity because the foreign key does not participate in the primary key. It would not, we, but we, it would not be a weak, well, technically it would be a weak entity in the sense that it's unable to be created without it. However, realistically, the rate ID does not participate. So do you know how there's, in one of the slides talked about a ID dependent, even though you could have an ID dependent with a strong entity, that's what that is. So if you made rate ID not null, this is an ID dependent strong entity. So in other words, part of it still depends on something else, but it's not its primary key. Yes. What do you mean? When, uh, with, with the... Uh, Yes, the and the issue you have is called an update anomaly. If I need to update the rate for rate ID number one, and I have 25 employees that are rate number one, that would mean I would need to update that rate for every single row. So I, uh, let's say I've got 25 employees. They've worked on 30 different projects. I'd still have to update the rate for 25 employees. Even though it's rate one, that's $110 an hour, we're going to suddenly start charging $110. Twenty dollars an hour for the rate one employees. That means I would need to update that value twenty five times. If it's like this, I change it once because there's only one entry for one in here. It'd be right. So the table would have the data like this: one, one ten, 
2, 1, 26. Otherwise, what you'd have is 1, 1, 10, 1, 1, 10, 2, 1, 26, 1, 1, 10. That means that if it's like this, you'd have to up three times. If it's here and it's referenced, you only need to change it here and the changes apply automatically to everything else because you only need to change the data once. That's your goal when you, just, when you do normalization is if I want to change, let's say an employee, their rate suddenly changes. So, you know, they've suddenly been with the company for five years. So they're suddenly going to become rate two. Instead of having to go through every single entry in the system, we just change their rate to two and suddenly the values would update. If I were going to do it where leaving it in there, I'd have to change it too, but then I'd also have to update the actual rate value. And then suddenly I could have people that are rate two at one number and then a rate different number. So suddenly you have data that no longer matches up properly. So that's why you want to break it down. Okay. I'm just going to take a picture of this board. Picture uploads are going to have to wait till I get home though. But I will upload them. All right, so now I'm going to erase this. Does anybody want to take a picture of this before I erase it on their own phones? Here, let me get right out of the way. Is there a hard rule? Usually the, the rule is if the part of the primary key is a foreign key, then it's a weak entity. If none of the, if no part of the primary key part is also a foreign key, then it's a strong entity. Rate is strong because this is strong, this one is strong. However, this one could be an ID dependent strong entity. Remember, there's like a couple of slides that talk about ID dependent. Yeah, if it's a weak entity, the primary key is always part of a, like, the part of the key will always be a foreign key when it's weak. So it could theoretically just be one of the three or one of the two elements is part of the foreign key, is, is a foreign key. But the second you have a foreign key involved in the primary key, it's weak. Yeah, but it, the rate ID does not participate in the primary key. So it, this one is. Yes, it's, yeah, exactly. It's not even a composite key at all. It's a single key. It could be a composite key. Okay, so now I'm going to diagram this. We're not done yet. Now we're drawing pictures. We get to see Dan's awful pictures. Okay, uh, that was a really bad erasing job. You know, for really expensive markers, they don't erase very well. All right, so we're gonna create a conceptual diagram from this. So we have four entities, so I'm gonna draw four boxes. And I've got employee. I've got rate. I guess I have an S on that one. I have um, timesheet and project. All right, so here's our four entities. We are going to draw our relationships between them. Now, I'm not putting in the cardinalities yet, and I'm not, I'm not, I haven't put the attributes in yet. So right now I've got four entities, and I know what the relationships are because I've already got them on the other board, right? Things are pink that are foreign keys, and you know, based on that, I know what's related to what. So I've got this. So now I'm going to put in my cardinalities.
let's go with a rate can be used by many employees, right? And each employee has one rate. Now, for the optional side of it, a rate could be used by zero or more employees. In theory, in theory, we could have a rate that's not used anymore. That's already in the system. So that means that the rate is optional. And if I use the example of my receptionist earlier, that one's also optional because an employee may not be assigned a rate. So right now we have employee. So an employee has one, zero or one rates assigned to them. Each rate can be assigned to zero or more employees. So this is a many to one. All right. Not necessarily, or for example, our receptionist at my day job does not have a rate. It's not her hourly rate what she gets paid. It's the hourly rate we charge our clients. The receptionist, we don't lend her to our, she doesn't get to go program. She can barely use her phone. I'm serious. She is not technologically inclined. She does her job well. But don't ask her to do anything complicated. She knows how to answer the phone and greet people at the door. That's her job. Now, she we do not contract her out. Therefore, she doesn't do that work. Therefore, she does not get a rate. We're not talking salary. You notice not once I said the word salary, it's a rate. So, for example, I've been with the company I'm at now for 20, almost 23 years. I'm actually one of the highest rate employees for our hourly rates. So, you know, I've been there for a while. I'm expensive. I'm expensive in the sense that they have to pay me a lot to be there and they have they pay they charge a lot for my time. I'm the only database ar database architect they have. Therefore, yeah, I'm expensive. Um well the way they do the math is I'm worth for every hour I work, I'm worth four hours. So that's how they do the math for my case. So I'm like a rate four. You know, one is one hour. Two for two hours. I'm a rate four. I'm cost four hours for every hour I work. So, you know, do this long enough. So now our projects, our projects again theoretically can be assigned to multiple timesheets. Might not be assigned to any timesheets because maybe it's a brand new project. Therefore, we haven't built it yet. Now every timesheet must have a product number because here it's part of the product, so it cannot be null. Therefore, it is mandatory. This is, again, a many to one, because it is many to one. However, in this case, the many to one is mandatory on this side. So what we got left is employee and timesheets. Same deal. In theory, an employee may not be accounted for in the timesheets. See my example of our receptionist. We don't bill her out, therefore she doesn't have to fill out timesheets. A timesheet entry requires, timesheet entry requires an employee. Oh, it's how the heck do you know who's being, whose time is being billed, right? So now we have all our cardinalities are in place. And hang on. So what I had up till now was what they called a standard ERD. There was no attributes on it. Now I am creating an extended or an expanded ERD, an EERD. And that means I'm putting on the attributes and showing off the primary keys. So we have our, um, the employee ID, which is 
I didn't give myself a lot of room. We have the name. We have the email. And we happen to have our rate ID. Like such. And since this is a foreign key and we decided on pink for foreign keys, there's our rate ID. Our project has a project number and a description. And that's its primary key. And now we have our timesheets down here. Now, there's two ways to actually do our primary key. We could choose to put them all in one bubble, which would be um, project ID and employee, uh, that's actually project number, employee ID. And we could theoretically do it all as a single bubble if we wanted to, or we could do them as separate bubbles. They're both valid. I'm gonna do them as separate. They're both valid takes on that. And then I'm also going to include the billing date because I do have it on that example, which happens to also be part of the primary key. And we have our hours. And since these are foreign keys, we're going to mark them off as foreign keys. So now, I put it as part of the primary as a part of the primary key over here to show a this is still a weak entity even though it's got something that doesn't depend as part of the primary key. That way, if I throw in billing date as part of the primary key, I could bill multiple times for the same project for the same employee. No, 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 it's its own thing. What do you mean? No, no. Okay, this is A, B, C, D. In this case, we got A comma B comma C determines D. Just what happens that A and B are also foreign keys. That's all it is. You're overthinking it. <laughs> no, B, BCNF is when you could have multiple determinants. So in theory, what we could have is the data could be in here like this. We got employee one, project one, three hours on Feb 15. In theory, employee one worked on project one, five hours, and it got billed on Feb 28. That means we before we had this, we could only ever bill once for an employee for a given project. This allows us to bill multiple times for the same project over time. And realistically, this is a lot more real than if we didn't have the date. No, it's three determinants. The employee, the project, and the date determines the hours. They're not, they, no, because I could never have. 1-1 one, one, February 15th, 1-1 one, one, February 15th the second time. That wouldn't that would not be allowed. I mean if it overlapped. Well, if the billing date is not part of the primary key, then I could do 1-1-3 one, one, Feb 15. And again, 1-1-3 one, one, Feb 15. That'd be an overlap. However, I could have employee two. Work on project one for three hours, and that wouldn't overlap. I'm waiting for him to come up with the next question. Okay. Yeah, no, I'd have to start with a whole new different example to do BCNF. I couldn't use what I have here. I'd have to start from scratch. There, It's already in BCNF. It's actually technically in fourth normal form too. And fifth. Because there are no, um, we don't have a case where we have two different determinants that could be used as a determinant. So that takes care of B, C, and F. We don't have multi-valued attributes, which we did not cover in this course. 
we'd have to get rid of that to solve for fourth normal form. I'm not even going there because that's not part of the test. <laughs> you need all three to be able to put in an hour. That's it. Okay. Now I'm going to take some more pictures and then I'm going to move on. Click. And I'm going to take another one of this because I can't remember if I took one in this current condition. Cell phones are the best thing ever. Okay, I'm going to erase this board. I am going to convert this diagram into a physical diagram now. Like I said, I was going to do the whole thing from start to end. Okay, let's start with our rates as a table. And we have a rate ID and a rate. So, so far, what I have here is a logical diagram. Why? Because there's no data types. Our rate ID is going to be an integer. Why? Because we already identified it as being a number on that example. And our rate is an hourly rate. Now we're talking it's money. Therefore, with money, you could use the money data type. However, money is only valid to two decimal places. If you are working with any kind of currency exchange, you always want at least three or four places of precision. So what would we use? We could directly use a float. But do we need like a, a gajillion numbers of precision? No. We'd want to use either a numeric or a decimal since they're interchangeable. They're aliases of each other to do the same job. So I'm going to make the rate a numeric. And if you recall, our numeric is the, the maximum number of digits total. And then the last two determines how many of those digits are reserved for decimal places. So in theory, so in, let's just say our maximum rate would be $999.99. It would be a 5.2. Like such. And this happens to also be our primary key. Fantastic. Now we're going to put in our employee. Man, I'm doing that close. Hang on. Like this. Now we have our employee ID. We have the name. We have an email. And we also have our rate ID. Like such. All right. Again, employee ID, we know it's a number. Is it a number? It is a number. No, so we're going to go with an int. And we know it's our primary key. Our name, that's probably going to be a var car, a variable character length. Because we don't know how long a person's name is really going to be. So we don't want to allocate that much room. Because if we do a car 50, it means it will always occupy 50 bytes in the database or multi-byte, depending on what kind of setup you've got. So it'll always occupy 50. So we want to use a var car, which only occupies the amount of space the, the text takes plus a tiny little bit. Do you want to come and write on the board? I kept it the name so I don't have to keep writing over and over again. Okay, so for our name, we're going to give ourselves Varkar75. That should cover a fair amount of names. Eh? It, I wouldn't say 99%, but it would cover probably 80% of names. If we happen to have somebody from, say, Puerto Rico, they have some really long names. Seven, eight. Yeah, I had one student that had uh, seven first names. 
First name was Joseph because he was Catholic. And anybody baptized Catholic male, the first name is Joseph. Regardless of where you are in the world, that's just how the Catholic Church works. Then he had his, his given name. Then he had his father's name, his grandfather's name, his great-grandfather's name. And then apparently some other person. And then his last name, which was actually two names. So he had a really long name. Just depending on where you're from in the world, you may have really long names. So I'm going with 75. That will cover 80, 85% of the world. Good enough. Email. I always give 150 characters for email. Some people look at me and they go, you're nuts. You don't need that much space for an email address. I have an anecdote. A little story from my second job. When I worked for a company called Digital Equipment. For those of you that don't know who that is, they got bought by Compaq, which later got bought by HP. I was there during the mergers. It wasn't a good time. We had... A division of our call center, because I wrote the software for the for, for some of the for a, we had customized call center software for part of our call center. And I wrote it. Or I should say I took it over. And they'd written it so that it had a limit of um fifty characters for an email. They thought that was good enough. Until one day we had one of our clients was a department of the government of Ontario. Back then, the email addresses in the government of Ontario were absolutely insane. And this lady's name was absolutely insane also. She was French from Quebec. She had a hyphenated first name and a hyphenated last name. Now, some people are going, huh? But she didn't even have short names. It wasn't like she was, her name was like Joanne. She had like Mirabel. I don't remember what it was. And her last name was like my last name. Baudin, her name was literally Boudreau Gaudreau. So she had both versions of my name, essentially, with a with a hyphen in the middle. Great. So, big, long last name, big, long first name. Well, we just ate through 30 characters, Rick 50. Back then, the email address of the government of Ontario was at the entire department name in French and English. Dot .on dot .gc So it was like um, natural resources, resources naturelles, dot on dot. So it was like her email address didn't fit. I had to do an emergency patch in the application. In the meantime, they just put in like a fake email address and said see notes. Like I think the email address is c at notes dot com, so that the person know go look at the notes for the person's email address. So after that, I learned 150 is enough, but some even then. So the rate ID we know is an integer because it's an integer up there and it's a foreign key. So if we were to draw the relationship, it would look like such. Because we've got to keep at least our pictures the same, right? So now we're going to grab our project. Project number, not project ID. And description. Okay, so suddenly we got an interesting situation. If we look at our data, our project number has a hyphen in it. It's not a number. Therefore, we have to make a decision. It's going to be a character field because there's a stupid dash in it. Otherwise, if you try to treat it as a number and you try to shove in 88 dash, I don't know, some other number, what do you think it's going to do? It's going to subtract it. It'll be 88 minus whatever, and that'll be the number it tries to store because it's actually going to try to execute the math. You'll see that after the break. Um, so our project number is a character field. From what we can see in our data, the character field is always the same length. Therefore, we can safely assume, based on what we have, that it's a fixed length that's always going to be that long. And to not pull a United States, we're going to give it a little extra room just in case. So we know it's six. Let's go with seven just to be on the safe side. And I'm actually going to make it a fixed length field just so that there's some variety in our data. 
I'm going to make that a car 7. And it's a primary key. Our description so far has been short. So we'll, again, we're going to go with a Varkar 50. Ta-da. And for those of you who wonder why I made, I made a comment about the United States, American Postal Codes. Five digits. It got to the point where a single postal code could represent over 2 million people. You can't sort mail for 2 million people. So they go, we ran out of postal codes, her, der, five digits, who needs more than that? So they ended up adding a dash and an extra four digits. They did it. They, so suddenly, you know, like 90210, you know, Beverly Hills could be, it was up to a million people for 90210. So then they added a, a routing number at the end so that suddenly you could subdivide it. Go figure. So then we just have our timesheet. Like such. And we have our employee. ID, which we know is an int. We have our project number, which we know is a car seven. And we have our hours and we have our billing date. Like that. Now I haven't assigned data types to hours and billing date. So far, all you've seen is whole numbers for hours. So based on the, num the information I gave you, it'd be safe to assume that it was an integer. But this is where we get the unknown. You know, do we ever bill by the half hour? Some companies do, some companies don't. So this is where you just make a judgment call or you do the smart thing and you call up the customer and go, do you ever bill by the half hour? No, we always round up to the next hour. Even if it's like, you know, one hour, 10 minutes, they're gonna charge you two hours. You know, it's also known as the, the bell rule. So hours, we're gonna make it an integer. And our billing date, we're actually gonna leave it as a date. Because in this case, the, uh, the hour doesn't mean anything. Uh, normally you care about the hours, but in this, but in, in this case, we don't. So we know that our employee ID is the primary key. But it's also a foreign key. Primary key, foreign key. That's part of the primary key. And we draw our relationship as such. And now we've gone from unorganized data to a physical diagram. And that is literally the entire first half of the term summarized in two hours without it make it looking like a review. <laughs> yes, I'm going to take a picture of this too. Pew. And another one here, just in case I didn't. Okay, so once again, as a quick and dirty reminder, the test is here next week. You don't write the test, you fail. No, I'm kidding. Well, you actually you'll fail the test, but not the course. Um, there is something different on this midterm. Um, yeah, you will notice, I gotta be careful not to get past the first page. Okay, so that's what the first page looks like. Okay, you will notice that there's three boxes on there. Your student number, your name and your signature. Fill those out. That is your attendance. I am not going to have a separate attendance sheet. If I don't have a paper without without that on there, I'm going to assume you were not here. And that somebody else wrote your test for you. Okay? That's what the front page looks like. The rules of engagement are on there. The fact that you put in your student number and your name and you sign it. That is your attendance. I meant to mention that earlier. Um, what else is due? Your assignments are due Sunday night, right? Yeah, as far as I know. No, no, no. Yes, the 17th is Sunday, isn't it? That's Friday. Are you sure? 
Okay, I'm wrong. Let me double check. I will double check, but I'm 90% sure it's not due till Sunday. Let me check the calendar. No, the 19th. That's a lab on, that's 19th is Sunday. The lab is Friday. The assignment is Sunday. So assignment is Sunday. You must be submitted before you demo. Otherwise, your lab prof will give you a zero. If you do not demo, you will get a zero. Do you notice the pattern here? Submit and demo, you get a grade. Don't submit and try to demo, you get a zero. Submit and don't demo, you get a zero. You don't submit and don't demo, well, that's easy. Yes, you cannot submit after. The pros will not let you demo if you didn't submit first. The point of the demo, just so you know, folks, the point of the demo is for us to verify you did the work yourselves. That you didn't go and do the good old uh, stack overflow. Or, because I've seen that, or the other one that's really popular. Um, not Google. The one you can pay money and somebody else gives you answers. Um, hey? Yeah, there's Course Hero and there's a couple of others like that where you can post your uh, question and then somebody, an expert, answers it for you and you pay a monthly fee. Uh, by the way, most of us have subscriptions to those. So we know when our questions show up in those systems. It's not worth it. Uh, one of my friend profs failed 70% of his class because of that. So don't use those things. So you must submit first. The demo is so that we can verify that you did the work. It's not a, usually the demo is not complicated. We ask you two or three questions about your work. Like, why did you choose to do this? Somebody in your group should be able to answer that question. If nobody can answer the question, we assume you didn't do the work. So that, and then you just have that. Uh, hybrid two is due on the 24th, which means after the 24th, you have no work for this course for almost two weeks. Because you're going to be on break for a week and nothing else gets assigned till after. So you will actually literally have almost nothing for this course for two weeks. That's it. All right, folks, that's it. That's all. Yep, yeah, hang on. Let me just uh, hit the stop.